Hello, and welcome back to Wendy's Way. Today, we're continuing our journey in food, and I am so excited. I've had so much fun today. You know when you were a kid and you looked forward to a gift catalog that used to come to the house before Christmas? And for us, it was the J.C. Penny catalog. It was full of toys and, you know, just about anything you could imagine. Sometimes it was like three inches thick. And I would go through that catalog and go through that catalog. And, you know, I didn't always get half the things that I asked for. But it didn't matter. It was all so crazy exciting. Well, now that I am a gardener, <laughs> I get crazy excited about a different kind of catalog because it comes right before Christmas and it just fills me with excitement for the spring and summer to come. While, you know, it might be snowy and blowy and icy outside, because I live in Northeast Iowa, and it is January 1st. <laughs> We've actually had a very mild winter. <clears throat> I wanted to tell you today about my new favorite catalog and turn you on to some incredible things if you have yet to explore this. I know a lot of people have because I've gotten the information from homesteading sites that I watch. <sighs> okay, without further ado, I'm gonna do some sharing about the Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds Catalog. Oh boy, oh boy. Are you ready for this? They always have a beautiful cover. Just an excuse all pink paper sticking out of it because, you know, I went through it for like hours today. Look at this lovely, this is the 2020 Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds Catalog with gorgeous flowers on the front. I don't remember the name of it. This is one of multiple catalogs that they release through the year. This one is, you know, like a thick magazine and it has dozens and dozens of seeds offered inside. It also has information about events that they either sponsor and or participate in. And I'm hoping that either this year or next year, I'll be able to join them. Um, oh, oh, where is it? I'm looking for it. <clears throat> there it is. The Spring Planting Festival. 2020. The Baker Creek Seed Company is located in Mansfield, Missouri. And, you know, Missouri is just one state down from Iowa. I'm guessing, you know, I could make it in less than a full day's drive. Most likely. Have to run the miles on it and get a route. They are having their annual Spring Planting Festival, May 3rd and 4th, 2020, in Mansfield, Missouri. They have renowned speakers. They have Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Who to thunk it? Um, Vandana Shiva, PhD. Holy moly. The 20th Annual Festival, the 3rd and 4th, Sunday and Monday. 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. both days held at the Mansfield, Missouri Farm and Seed Company. And of course, Off Grid with Doug and Stacy are gonna be there. They were one of the first YouTube channels that turned me on to the Baker Creek Seed Company. They also have a National Heirloom Seed Expo in Santa Rosa, California. That will definitely not be on my agenda. Would it be a blast? 
Oh, yeah. Uh, do I think I'll ever visit California again after living there for seven years and feeling liberated after we get out? Likely not. <laughs> but oh, for the thousands of people that do, it's a blast. Okay. Heirloom seeds. They are, you know, I don't have the technical description. When you purchase seeds to plant and grow, hybrid seeds have are being offered by all kinds of seed companies. And they're not, if you save the seeds from hybrids, chances are they will not reproduce. And if they do reproduce, you're not going to get the highest quality of fruits and vegetables from them. Heirloom seeds are from plants and varieties and species, species that have been grown and, you know, cultivated and nurtured for centuries, literally, on a lot of these plants. So, and a lot of these plants, they even know the original origin. Many of them come from international locations and they know who's and how's and why's. They were brought to the Baker Creek Seed Company. Hmm. I don't want to take up your entire day, but I spent hours today going through the catalog and making my preliminary plan for the seeds I'm going to purchase this year and, you know, the how many's and the where I'm going to put them. This, I'm sure, looks like just a bunch of scribble to you. But I have a rain gutter grow system garden, which means that technically everything I grow is planted in a five gallon bucket of potting mix. And you position the five gallon buckets with a net cup hanging underneath into a rain gutter that you fill with water. And that is how you water your plants. Most of those that I grow will grow on trellises, um, you know, that are stationed over the rain gutter and the five gallon buckets. This will be my third year of rain gutter gardening. And so I just laid it out because I have a row of six uh, rain gutters, five, four, three, and then I have four more rows which actually run um, sure, an animal panel raised arch in between. So I use those things for vining plants. I also have trellises, straight animal panels vertically over these buckets so that I can grow pole beans and so that I can tie up tomato plants and pepper plants to secure them so they don't blow over rather than using tomato cages and things of that nature. Um, this means that I have in the neighborhood of 110 buckets. That's a lot of buckets. And <laughs> I'm going to fill them all with veggies. Uh, one row even with an herb, which is also a flower. Last year I grew a multitude of tomato plants. I grew beans and peas. I grew peppers, oodles and scoodles of peppers. On one trellis I also planted birdhouse gourds and on the other trellis I planted loofah gourds. Now, everything is by trial and error, by experience, as to what works well in this particular grow system, in my particular region of the country, the length of your growing season, the weather that you get, 
within your growing season, the amount of rain, so on and so on. In my situation, the rain isn't quite as impactful um, because I do rain catchment and when I don't have enough, I will water my plants, you know, with well water from the small town that I live in. They have some pretty decent well water, but rainwater catch so that I can fill the rain gutters at any particular time that I need to. And growing in buckets, these plants drink a lot of water. I have learned by experience my rain bucket grow system, rain gutter grow system, doesn't work exceedingly well for tomatoes. Probably because I didn't fertilize much. I just gave them a little bit of natural fertilizer in the way of um, water that had been thoroughly steeped, shall we say, in rabbit manure. <laughs> the year before I used rabbit manure directly and that worked better yet. I won't hesitate to use natural organic fertilizers. I will not use anything, you know, no herbicides, no pesticides, anything like that. I'll use natural fertilizers in the soil and I'll do my level best to grow everything without putting anything else on it or around it other than natural things. Last year, all of the produce that I grew, I brought in and preserved and shared a good chunk of it. I dehydrated a lot of hot peppers. I canned scads of beans. I canned a lot of tomatoes. I even still have frozen tomatoes in my freezer from my garden that still need to be processed technically, canned or used in some other method. This year, more of my produce is going to be used and more of the plants that I'm gonna grow right off the bat are going to be offered at a local farmer's market. Um, I understand they need more vendors at this local farmer's market, you know, to draw more customers. You need a larger variety. There are many people at the local farmer's market, I've been told, who offer um, jams and jellies and baked goods and, you know, beautiful handcrafted items. But people have told me that they're looking for more fresh, fresh vegetables. And some have told me that they will come looking for plant starts. So this is what I'm going to do. A portion of what I grow, I will process and keep for myself and for family. But I'm going to work on, <clears throat> excuse me, growing things for farmer's market. So <coughs> Sorry, I have some things sitting <clears throat> on the back of my tongue from a recent meal, obviously. It's giving me a tickle. So, I'm going to roll through the seeds that I'm going to order. Real quick, just so you can see a little bit of the variety. Because there's too much. You simply need to get a catalog. Uh, the website, and I will link it in the description of this video is rareseeds.com. Simple enough, right? Double check myself. I was sure it was rare seeds. Try heirloomseeds.com as well. That's the one that I wrote down. I'll get it all linked. Okay. First thing I'm gonna start with is asparagus. I tried a few last year. I had very limited luck. Um, yeah, for a lot of reasons. I'm going to try this one this year. It is, it has a name. Yes, it does. I have it written down. Oh, just got it written down as asparagus. 
conifers colossal asparagus is what I'm going to attempt to grow. I realize it'll take me two or three years before I'll get a harvest. I love it well enough. If I don't get a great big harvest, I may just keep it for myself. If I do get a great big harvest, I'll be selling some. Don't you know it? All right. The next thing I'm going to order is something that I grew last year. And I was so delighted with it. I will likely keep some for myself, but I'm going to grow a ton of them and take them to the farmer's market. I grow beans. The one that I'm ordering is called purple potted pole bean. And prolific would be an understatement. Last year, I planted purple potted pole beans in five buckets with over a 10 foot rain gutter with an eight foot animal panel as a trellis. And the beans climbed to the top. It took them a little while to bloom. I was beginning to wonder because the bush beans that I planted last year were blooming and putting on fruit. And I waited and I waited, but once these purple potted pole beans started putting on, they bloomed and bloomed and put on beans and bloomed and put on beans. And these beans would ripen so quickly. It was incredible, incredible. So in my garden this year, I am actually going to plant 10 buckets. I'm gonna double up on the purple potted pole beans. Um, you know, not only did they continue, continue to bloom, but they were just full. And the coolest part about growing pole beans, for someone my age, my size, and with arthritis in my lower back and my knees as I have, I was standing on my tippy toes to harvest beans. It was the coolest thing. Rain gutter grow system. You're not bending over. You're not weeding. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. I can't wait to show it to you all again. So that makes two things. The next one. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, there are oodles of beans in here, all different kinds. But because I insist on a pole bean. Because bending over to pick bush beans is a pain in my back. So I don't do it. These are Kentucky Wonder green pole beans. If there was any veggie that I had a request for, more than most last year, it was green beans. People wanted green beans. And... Um, but like I'm saying, they have everything from red swan beans, string beans. They have snake beans. These things are like three feet long. You know, one bean would be enough for a meal for a small family. Cuckooness. Okay. Pole beans. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And the next one because I really want to offer something like people have never seen before. I'm ordering the green climbing noodle beans. <laughs> they look like a string bean, but you harvest them like at 18 to 20 inches long. You know, they have red ones as well. They get really big, but you know, with the purple, and the green, I figured if I'm going to give them something really like they've never seen before in my little neck of the woods, I better stick with green if I want anybody to want it. Because, you know, there are some adventuresome eaters in my neck of the woods and there are a lot of people who just aren't. <laughs> okay, now this is called a fruit. 
It is listed in the middle of the cucumbers, just so you know. I've never grown cucumbers because everybody and their stepbrother grows cucumbers. And everybody has a bucket full they try to pawn off on you. Right before the zucchini or right after the zucchini or whatever it is. So I'm not growing any zucchini either. But these are, are called an amazing baby fruit. The Mexican Sour Gherkin. Mexican, oh, I've got this reflection going. Mexican Sour Gherkin. They look like a miniature watermelon. And evidently they even have a little fruity taste. Technically, they're a cuke, a pickle. You know, you could slice it and put it on a salad. You could can them as pickles. Um, and they're little. And it said they've got a really good shelf life. So individuals who cook for themselves, you know, prepare food for one or two. I'm thinking those are going to be a lot of fun. I've never seen anything like it. And you can pickle them, obviously. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next one is something I hope people around here will be interested in. I, I love, with most people, it's a love or hate thing, with eggplant. Eggplant is very good for you. And you can make it taste like anything you want. You can put it in anything you want. It's a lot like zucchini, only it's not so wet. Um, it's a little more fibrous, a little more solid. And so instead of growing the typical, you know, black or purple, I'm going to try white, white eggplant. I think it's going to be awesome. It's called Casper. Isn't that clever? Okay, next, next. What do I have marked next? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I grew a ton of these last year. And I have no idea whether they will regrow from the place where I grew them last year. It's very possible. Maybe. But I'm going to add some. I'm going to put them in buckets. And I'm going to grow oodles of them. Because... I know that not only can I process and share, I can freeze them. Ground cherries, Aunt Molly's, Aunt Molly's ground cherries. That's what they are. Or they call them husk fruit. They call them all kinds of different things. I grew up with ground cherries, um, picking them up that grew wild. And you know they're totally ripe when the husk uh, turns creamy, tan, almost brown, and it falls off the plant onto the ground. Growing them in buckets, I'm going to come up with some sort of system. I hope that I can place underneath them a catchment system for the berries, so to speak. Um, last year I had them in a raised bed that's three to four feet deep and leaning in and leaning over and picking them up off the ground in the dirt and getting it in your fingernails. Not a hot, a, not hot, a, not a lot of fun for this fat chick. <laughs> I'm looking for ease. I'm looking for interesting. I'm looking for the big bad yum factor. All right. Now I... It sounds crazy. One of the first things most people grow when they start gardening, because it's so easy, I've been told, is lettuce. I'm not a big fan. I like a good sturdy head of romaine lettuce every now and then. Um, but again, I grow in buckets. I don't grow in rows in the ground. I don't grow in raised beds. So growing a quantity is not so easy to do unless you do something and I'm going to give it a shot. It's called a little gem. And 
what it looks like is like a half size romaine style lettuce. And, you know, at that size, probably one little head would be a big salad for an individual. Again, I, I like to think about that. Um, you know, a few of the friends I know who like to shop farmer's markets are, you know, independent living like I am now. So they don't necessarily want to purchase fresh produce in volume. Even anything preserved in volume because, you know, when you're trying to eat healthy and you're preparing food for one person, it doesn't take a lot of food. Which, for my budget, is a very positive thing. All right. Another thing I've never grown before, successfully, <laughs> are melons. And again, I want to grow something like people in Northeast Iowa are not familiar with, have not seen. So I have picked out a Tigger melon. Tigger is in T I double G er, you know, from Winnie the Pooh. Because <laughs> that's what it looks like. And let's see, the fruit is a vibrant yellow with brilliant fire red zigzag stripes. A few might be solid yellow. Uh, let's talk about the flavor. Rich, sweet, intoxicating aroma that will fill the room. White flesh, a mild tasting, small fruit, weighs on the average a pound. Can you tell my computer screen keeps kicking on? Alrighty, here they are. It's a Tigger Melon. I, isn't that just cool? I hope I get a ton of them. That's one of those things that I'm gonna grow on the trellis panels. Ooh, pray for that one. I really like melons. You know, they're, um, I really don't think you can preserve them, but, you know, I'm going to eat them and sell them. Alrighty. Then I got to the peppers page. And I grew scads of peppers last year. Peppers seem to grow as well, if not better, than any other plant I have tried in a five gallon bucket in a rain gutter grow system. And last year I had scads of them. I chopped, diced most of them up and put them in freezer bags. The bell peppers and the low heat poblano, etc and a few of the jalapeno. I had a lot of uh, some lemon spice jalapeno from Baker Creek last year. This year, I am gonna grow some hot peppers, but I'm gonna grow some unusual varieties. Again, to switch things up because I still have dehydrated and ground habaneros coming out my ears that I need to mix with the seasonings and the salts from last year and the Peking peppers, and uh, I even dehydrated and ground up some green habaneros, which is kind of cool. But this year, I'm gonna try some new things and not grow as many. I am going to, I'm not even, even sure how to pronounce it. Luchur, Lusur. it's a paprika pepper. I've never grown a paprika pepper before. It's this one up here in the corner but, you know, because I like to dehydrate peppers and grind them up as seasoning, why not make paprika? You know, it really is a, a smoky warm pepper. I really didn't know that until like a year or two ago. I didn't know that paprika was ground dehydrated pepper plant. 
Um, the next one I'm going to do, it's another hot one. This one, it's called a Brazilian starfish. It boasts complex floral and fruity tones that are perfectly offset by medium heat. The fruit is always juicy and quite sweet. I like sweet hot. And I've never seen a pepper like this in my area. So these are Brazilian starfish peppers. Oh, I hate that reflection. Should have done something different. Brazilian starfish pepper. Yeah, starfish peppers. <laughs> I'm gonna grow. Uh, because, you know, peppers grow well, so we're going to see how they turn out. Um, so yeah, still on the peppers. <sighs> Can't get away from jalapeno. Last year, I did a lemon spice. This year, they have pumpkin spice and orange spice, but I decided I have jalapeno yet in the freezer. Coming out my ears, I want to try something different and something that I can offer. At the farmer's market, I'm going to grow brown jalapenos. Brown jalapenos. Um, chocolate colored pods. Smoky and flavorful. Four to six inches long. Ideal for stuffing and roasting. High yields. Sweet flavor and vigorous growth. Yum. All right, what's next? The last pepper, again, it was one I grew last year. And if nobody else likes them, that's fine with me because it is absolutely my favorite. I might even freeze some whole this year instead of dicing them all up. Poblano peppers are my absolute favorite. They have just a wee bit of kick. They're almost a tiny bit bitter, which I like. It's the pepper typically used to make chili relleno. I've heard it pronounced relleno. Chili relleno. You know, where they um, roast them and stuff them with eggs and cheese, etc., etc. Excellent peppers. Poblano is on my list. And yeah, I do have about 110 buckets. So, you know, I'll grow five to 10 buckets of everything on my list. Um, when it comes to sweet peppers now, I'm going to grow something else I've never seen before. These are called Lesia, L-E-S-Y-A. And they're a super sweet, beautiful, gorgeous, not too big, um, scarlet red, heart-shaped sweet pepper. I will admit, even though I grew scads of habaneros last year, now they have habanada, which means all the pepper flavor, none of the heat. I don't think I want to go there. Maybe next year. They have uh, nada peños too, you know, which is all the flavor, none of the heat. And the other sweet pepper I'm going to grow, which I think ought to go over really well at the farmer's market, is called a yellow monster... Look at the size of those stinkers. You know, if I would typically go and buy three bell peppers, you might be able to just buy one. <laughs> That's a lot of pepper. All right. Now we've gotten through that part. Yellow monster bell. What was next? I'm only growing one variety of tomato this year. Last year... I had seven varieties and, or six, um, yeah, they grew well. I have oodles and scads of them canned in my pantry, but, um, for the most part, I grew tomatoes for Bubba and, you know, because Bubba loves tomatoes. He absolutely loved tomatoes his favorite food from the garden. And now that he's gone, I still have a half a pantry full of tomatoes. 
I'm going after the tomato juice for all I've got. I love tomato juice. If I want to juice tomatoes, I'll go up to the um, market in Elma this coming spring and, you know, just grab a whole bunch of tomatoes rather than trying to grow enough to juice um, or to sell. I'm growing one variety, which will mean, you know, five, five plants, five buckets. And it's their best selling. It's a grape tomato. It is called Atomic Grape. No, they have not been photoshopped. That is a true and actual photograph of the Atomic Grape tomato. If I remember how I read it, the flesh is even light green. And the colors on the outside, and they grow in to a variety of sizes. Let's see, elongated large cherries in clusters. The color and flavor is a full-blown assault on the senses. Lavender and purple stripes turning to technicolor olive green, red, brown, blue stripes when fully ripe. Really wild. Fruit holes well on the vine are off, making this amazing variety a good candidate for market growers. Olive green interior is blushed with red when dead ripe. Crack resistant, extraordinarily sweet. Um, it, yeah, you know, I love cherry tomatoes. And imagine if you're gonna share them or sell them, why not have something crazy, crazy like that? <laughs> Okay, and they do have oodles and, and scoodles of tomato styles, you know, from striped and spotted and solid and purple and black and orange and yellow and, you know, big and little and tomatillos and husks and, you know, they've got it all. And they even have a bigger catalog than this one. They have... Oh, yes, I'm going to get the name of it. I think I am. The Whole Seed Catalog. That one, it's bigger, it's better. It's the new Whole Seed Catalog. This one, they will send you free of charge. And it has oodles and scads, plus information, plus, plus. When you place an order, you get free seeds. They throw in whatever they're throwing in as a freebie that day. Ha <laughs> ha. Got some awesome stuff last year. Okay. The last thing. And it's classified as an herb. Even though it puts out an exciting looking flower. It's called safflower. Dark orange red. It's an annual. That's why I'm growing it in a bucket. You know, it's not a perennial that'll come back. Fantastic deep orange petals that make an excellent saffron substitute. Have you ever had saffron? It's the most expensive spice. It's made from the stamen of crocus flower. And it's a very earthy, musky, savory flavor doesn't taste like anything that I could compare it to, but it's pretty amazing. So this is going to put on these gorgeous flowers. You can use them. They actually call it a poor man's saffron. Not only to be used in the kitchen, but the dark orange red is a gorgeous ornamental. And the stiff, almost prickly plants have been used for centuries as natural fencing to keep animals out of your garden. So if you plant in the ground, it's the one here in the middle in the top. Safflower. Poor man, saffron. Yipper. That's the last thing out of the book. And, um, so excited. <laughs> you know, um, 
I'll get a bunch of these ordered soon. And then we'll have another unboxing video where I can gush and get even more excited and make plans for setting up my lights. And I'm going to do it in the basement this year because, you know, I have a complete 1,600 foot, almost, unfinished basement. A lot of tools and things. It's been used as a workshop. It's been used as a spare bedroom. It's been used as everything down there. Um, but now I have no competition <laughs> for the use of it. So I'll be setting up tables and LED shop lights and I'll be using it to start plants. So there. All right. That is my spring 2020 garden plan from the Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds Company. It is their 23rd annual Pure Seed Book. Wow. Free shipping on all North American orders. That's good information too. Rareseeds.com, heirloomseeds.com, all takes you to the same place. Okay, folks. This is it. It's Garden Planning 2020. I thank you for joining me here at Wendy's Way. I'm so excited that you came to join me. I hope that you might share this video, subscribe to my channel, like the video, and uh, come back and visit more often while we share all kinds of new adventures in the new year. So, for once and for all, may the good Lord who blesses me each and every day of my life bless you as well, today and always. Amen.